So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Annie. I'm the speaker liaison for ICAD London. It's my great pleasure to introduce Alistair Morty and Billy Moore. Ali is an international addiction counselor, author, and expert speaker who co-founded the cabin in Chiang Mai in 2016, the first rehab in the world to treat addiction and trauma using Muay Thai kickboxing and triathlon training. Ali writes on addiction for many publications, including CNN and Asian Correspondent, recently appeared on ABC News in Australia, and in the documentary Between the Lines. Billy Moore uh, struggled with addiction and wrote about his experiences in his book A Prayer Before Dawn, which was later adapted for the screen and premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2017. He has now completed his second book, Surrender from the Heart, which focuses on his traumatic childhood exploring what led to his addictions. The presentation today is entitled Post-Traumatic Growth, The Role of Fighting Sports in Overcoming uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences, the ACEs. They will look, talk about their investigation into the tradition of boxing, Muay Thai, and MMA for overcoming trauma and poverty, something we believe is very important at ICAD, and I'm going to turn it over to Ali and Billy. Welcome. Thanks, Annie. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, my name's Alistair Mordy. Uh, I'm joined by Billy, Billy Moore, um, author, boxer, um, and we're here to talk about post-traumatic growth, which is a somewhat less well-discussed subject than post-traumatic stress. So we hear a lot about post-traumatic stress and PTSD proper as addiction counselors and psychotherapists and practitioners. What we don't seem to talk a lot about is how people can actually get stronger through these experiences, which arguably often they don't, but some do. And we really need to key in to how that happens. And we can break it down. And I couldn't think of a sort of better example of uh, a human who's managed to do this uh, than Billy Moore. And he's written at length about it in the book, A Prayer Before Dawn, and his new book will actually go back and tell the backstory a bit and talk about adverse childhood experiences, which of course is another thing that we deal a lot with as addiction counselors. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to rabbit on endlessly for about 20 minutes before Billy gets in, in a word in edgeways and his nerves are, are going to be up there all the time. And so I do apologize for that, Billy. I'll try and cut you in where I can, but I need to set the scene. So I'm just going to introduce Billy a bit more in depth, myself, and then go over the main concepts that we're going to talk about, and then we'll be going into conversation. So you can't see the photo too well, I'm afraid. Um, I think when the video plays back later, that will probably be in better relief. There's Billy in his heyday in Thailand, right? That's in Chiang Mai, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, Billy boxed from an early age. He's a boxer. He learned Muay Thai when he was in Thailand. Uh, he is obviously the author of A Prayer Before Dawn, which is a fantastic read, a real page turner. Um, the film was a real hit. It won an award at uh, a British Film Award, I believe, Joe Cole, um, Best Lead Actor. So Joe Cole of Peaky Blinders fame played Billy pretty well. Um, and Billy's the current chairman of Danny's Place, which is uh, a, a project in Liverpool that's aimed at reducing knife crime through boxing training and apprenticeships, etc. And as Annie mentioned, Billy's currently finished his second book, uh, Surrender from the Heart. I obviously um, had to have an action shot as well. Billy's got an action shot, so I had to have an action shot. So that's my back. Um, I think uh, you're in there somewhere, Alexandra, are you as well? This is me and um, various clients of the cabin when we were running our Muay Thai and triathlon um, treatment programs. So we insisted that young men between 18 and 28 had two choices. They could either um, fight, gr graded, you know, we didn't throw them in the lion's den, but they could either do Muay Thai or they could do triathlon, along with other traditional modalities like 12 steps and CBT, mindfulness training, etc. Um, we're based in Thailand, as Annie said. I actually founded, um, co-founded the cabin group in 2010. I think it's probably, arguably, the biggest treatment group outside of the US. By 2016, it was anyway. Then we formed The Edge, which was the young men's program within that project. Um, today is actually my last day officially with the cabin. I wish them all the best. I'm moving on to new ventures. Um, 
one of which is Elevate Health, which is a blockchain company. So we seek to reward, it's a reward platform that rewards people for stopping smoking, et cetera, via various M Health applications. So we're doing some rather different things to what we have done up till now. So that's me. Um, I've also completed my first book, which is called Meet the Reptile, which is a kind of mythopoetic um, book about addiction. It follows a young man who decides that addiction is the only hero's journey that's really available. And so it sort of follows the idea of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which is kind of what we're going to talk about with Billy today. Many of us who grew up in a postmodern world of deindustrialization and no idea about what men's roles are, etc., cetera, et cetera, found a kind of underworld of our own. Um, but I suppose one would argue uh, we're not traditional heroes, probably more rather anti-heroes. But that's the general idea. But you get to the same place in the end. So that's me and Billy. Key ideas that we need to, uh, I'd like you guys to hold in the back of your mind when Billy's talking are, firstly, adverse childhood experiences. We know what these are. They're well documented. They've been studied, um, particularly out of uh, Kaiser Permanente in America. They've done you know, wide-ranging studies on what constitutes an adverse childhood. Um, bereavement in the family, um, separation of parents, um, incarceration of family members, mental health in the nuclear family, substance abuse in the nuclear family, physical and emotional abuse, uh, sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect. So hold those ideas in your, in your mind as Billy starts to talk. Um, and yes, we also know there's a dose-response relationship between ACE and adult poor uh, health outcomes in adults, not just addiction. Bronchitis is higher in people who have a lot of ACEs. Heart disease is higher in people who have a lot of ACEs. And the more ACEs you have, the more ill you are as an adult. So it's a dose-response relationship. Okay, this is a quote by Bessel van der Kolk, who's a sort of guru of uh, trauma. Um, I'm going to be controversial and really annoy some people. Um, the word trauma in this field is used promiscuously. Um, it's overused. There's a difference between trauma and adversity. Both of them cause addiction. Billy has both of them in spades in his story. So do many of us. But there is a difference. And Bessel van der Kolk defines it like this. Trauma is something that overwhelms your coping capacities, in other words, your nervous system, and confronts you with the thought, Oh my God, it's all over. There's nothing I can do. I'm done for. I may as well die. That is what trauma is like. Many of you will know that. I just want you to hold that thought and think about trauma and adversity as slightly different things, although both massive contrib contributors to addiction. Thirdly, uh, me and Billy have been talking about this a lot. Hormesis or uh, hormetic growth is the sort of... Um, idea coming out of biology really, um, the idea that a, a stressor or a toxin when delivered in a sublethal dose act can actually strengthen the organism. And what we're now starting to ask is can this happen psychologically as well? And the answer is almost certainly yes. A good example in a purely physiological sense would be um, poisons like Cambo that are used by, uh, favored by alternative health people n these days. So Cambo, Cambo is a frog poison. They administer it through burns on the skin. You then spend 12 hours purging like hell, and it then has a massively steroidal effect on you for weeks and months afterwards. Of course it does, because your body thinks it's going to get poisoned again, so it starts to strengthen. And this can happen psychologically as well by, by way of stressors or tra traumas. When that happens, that's known as post-traumatic growth, PTG. So the idea that you can get a positive psychological growth out of your traumas. Now, it's not quite that simple, and it, it depends on how you go about your life post-trauma, right? But that is obviously what we're going to discuss uh, in depth. And so without further ado, let's get into it. Um, Billy, you are rather an angelic-looking child, if, n if not perhaps quite so angelic a looking teenager. <laughs> I mean... What was it like uh, growing up in Liverpool in the 1970s and 80s? 
Uh, it was quite um, it was quite frightening because the atmosphere at home was violent. My dad drank a lot. Uh, my mum got battered by my father. There was six of us. I was the oldest. Um, I was taking care of my five younger siblings. So I was never allowed to be a child. I was never allowed to kind of like uh, just play out and just be. It was more like I took an adult role on pretty quick. Um, and I was always, like, we never had any intimacy in our house. We were never told we were loved. Um, I think my mum never had the time to really. She was doing a few other jobs. And I think the only time we ever had experienced any kind of intimacy was when we were getting the nick home, put through our air on a Sunday night. And my mum be sitting there and that was like the closeness. And, to me, that was that was something I'd look forward to, if that makes any sense. Um, and I was always, my dad never spoke. He would never speak to you. He'd never tell you what was going on. He'd sit there with his with his drink, his you know, kind of like constantly. Uh, he'd be arguing and uh, kicking off over his food not being prepared, and you know. And I, he was my hero. As you know, you, you, he's your role model. He's my father. He's you know, he's someone I looked up to. He was he was bigger than me, and you know he. I think when he was drunk, he'd tell me stories about what a great boxer he used to be, and right. I kind of um, I wanted to to show him that I could be the same as him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've talked about it. You there were kind of two reasons why you went on uh, in your adolescence to do boxing initially. Mm. One, rather naively, but also rather na wonderfully, was to protect your mum. Yeah, and two, uh, it's the almost the opposite to emulate. Your father, yeah. because he was a boxer, he was quite handy. Actually, I want to do a reading, if I may. I'm only going to do two readings from Billy's book, but there's a wonderful passage which you can then reflect on um, for us, Billy, which, which talks about this. And we'll give you some, some flavor of what it was like um, growing up uh, as Billy. Um, I could paint an endless, dreary picture of my childhood, but one memory sums it up. It was my birthday. I was 12 years old. My mum had been saving for weeks to buy me some new clothes from a catalogue. I'd chosen them myself. Silver grey cords and a silver grey patterned top. Smart. I wore them with pride all day. It was my birthday. No one else's day, just mine. Not Father's Day or Mother's Day or Christmas Day or any other day. My day, my birthday. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm 12 today, and I can stay out until half past seven with my mates instead of being home by seven. And that's what I did. When I got home, I expected my five younger siblings to be there to sing me happy birthday, expected my mum to have a cake baked. I was stopped in my tracks by my dad, my father, Tony, 15 stone, 5'10", an ex-boxer and a heavy drinker. He was habitually unemployed, a social scrounger, a bad husband, and a violent father. Where the hell have you been? What time do you call this? I told him, it's my birthday. Come here and I'll give you a damn birthday present, you ginger-headed bastard. Perhaps I should have run, but I froze instead. And the next thing I knew, his fist had landed squarely on my nose and blood was spurting all over my silver gray top and my silver gray trousers. My mum was screaming, you evil bastard, leave him alone. My brothers and sisters sat at the jelly-laden table, eyes staring, chins wobbling, Tears filling their eyes, paper, par uh, paper party hats on their head. My mum started to tear the clothes off me. They'll stain, she kept repeating. I stood there half naked, shivering in the kitchen, whilst my dad shambled off into the living room to watch TV. It wasn't the first time I'd been beaten, and it wasn't the last. And I later discovered in heroin that it was a refuge, a warm, happy place to curl up in where no one could get to me, where I could have a real birthday whenever I wanted. No fear, no pain, perfect. That's a, just a great, you know, quite, yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> just take a moment. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad you read it anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful honest. passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, tell us a little bit. See, when I was preparing to write this, this book, I had to go really right back and reflect on, on sort of like what contributed to, to where I was at that present moment. You know, because it was innocence and, you know, there was, um, I had hopes and dreams and I'd be becoming something or someone or, or, or attaching myself to, to anyone. And um, 
I don't know. It was quite. It was quite difficult to write that passage. I remember writing it, and I sent it to my mum. I don't know why. You know, I was in a prison. You know, and I wrote it, and it was on an A4 piece of paper. And I sent it to my mum, and she, you know, spoke to her, and she broke down because I think, like, my dad and my mum and and and, 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 the, and the family before us kind of like wanted to kind of like just dismiss what happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? As we were kids, and then. Um, kind of its own, but it was like a significance, it was one of those memories, you know, where your mother's scrimping and scraping to, 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 to purchase something out of a catalogue once a week or once a month and, you know, and um, you've got nothing, you know. Well, I like the way that you emphasise um, her obsession with cleaning it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've spoke about this today, actually. Yeah. Um, that that's kind of a compensation. You know, mum was obviously like, something serious going on, but she's obviously, obviously she's more worried about him than the trousers, <laughs> right? Um, but you noted that, and that's why you wrote it that way. Yeah. Because you noticed that she was doing that. And there's all sorts of, uh, there's a million things in that passage that are really insightful. Um, now, I gather, you know, to your eternal credit, you. you your father's passed away, unfortunately, the last few years, a yeah. um, few years ago. But you made your peace with him before he went, yeah. which is important for us, obviously, in recovery. Um, this is something that we do, if we possibly can. Um, do it for us as much as for him. Yeah. Um, so you got some peace there. And interestingly, you played your own father right at the end of the film. So Billy has a cameo as his, own, as his dad um, visiting um, Billy in prison at the end of the film, which is, that was cathartic as well, and quite strange how it yeah, came about. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the director said to me, did, you know, did your father ever come to see you while you were in prison? You know, and he never, my mum did, she travelled up and down the length of Bradford, the UK, and she wrote, and you know, she was always there in some small way, um, and I respect that. But my father, you know, he, he, never, he never came, and when the director asked me that question, I said no, and he said, well, he will do in this film. And I asked him how would that be possible. He passed away, you know. He died of cancer. He said that you know I'd, I'd be grateful if you'd play the role of your father. And I'd like you to think about it without giving me an answer immediately. Obviously, I'm not going to say yeah, you know, or no. It was like it was quite hard, you know. And um, I went back and I spoke to my family about it, and um, it was a way of acknowledging my dad's life in a sense because you know I understood that. He went through some traumas and, you know, he never spoke about it. And, you know, as I went further along in my recovery, I gained a lot of awareness and understanding and, and I had empathy and compassion, you know what I mean? Um, but it was that role where I was in the Philippines, it was 5 a.m., it was the last scene, uh, and this young actor was coming towards me and he'd already done a character study, so he knew about my background and um, he was... He was angry, you could, you know, because this is how he, he, he kind of played the role. He, he, he was angry, but he was he was in open. He had a lot of mixed feelings going on. And the director said, "What would you, as your father, want to say to your young self?" Mm. And I, I couldn't even muster the words. You know, all I wanted to hear from his dad was, "I love you." And that was um, just them three simple words. He's like, "I love you," and um, I couldn't even manage that. Mm. You know what I mean? And and I think. When the camera was on us, words were best left unspoken. You know, because the feelings that I was going through uh, kind of reflected uh, on, the, on, on, on screen anyway. So that was... Um, but the, the ironic thing was, my dad had just passed away of cancer. And whilst I was on set, I was diagnosed with cancer. So it was like I'd been diagnosed with stage 3 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My dad has just passed away and playing a role in my father. Um, and that was just like... Yeah, difficult. it's a fair amount of um, trauma. Yeah. <laughs> going just about every kind. Let's... We have a, we've got an hour and a half, which is barely time to cover your, your life. Mm. So I'm going to move us on. I mean, but let's, let's put it this way. Um, in boxing, you found initially some kind of relief, some kind of esteem, mm. some kind of brotherhood how, how would you describe it what was it that you found in boxing that you weren't getting at home see I was never picked 
in f- football teams or nothing. You know, I always felt different, separate and alone. I always felt different from my own family. But standing in a line and, 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 and having young lads go, we'll have him, we'll have him, and, and then you're left there, just feeling rejected and abandoned. It was like, so I decided that, you know, I'll be independent and, and, and I'll, I'll fight, you know. And not only did um, I get respect from the guys in the gym, I started to respect myself. I started to be, you know, build a lot of confidence. Um, I could start, I'd, you know, talk to girls and, uh, 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 and meet friends and go to places. And it was something because I was isolated, you know what I mean? And um, it was that camaraderie ship and the unity and collectively as a team, people were helping each other, showing, you know, little moves and, you know, little secrets and little plans of, like, out of box clever and it was all about thinking and not just being aggressive and angry and, and just getting in there and throwing yourself at someone else. It was like, okay, think about what you're going to do. Think about the move before they make it. And um, yeah, it was like an education. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we um, <coughs> used to tell parents and um, I used to e- even speak about it at conferences is, is um, when young males in particular, it's actually everybody, but particularly young men are um, placed in stressful situations, uh, they've researched this with young male rats, and when they introduce the uh, predator smell, um, they start to bond more closely, obviously. Um, and this is what happens um, in stressful situations for young men, is they, they, they bond up much, much more. And I can tell you that's exactly how it is at the Edge Project, when we used to put them in there. We used to have a, a, a Muay Thai um, trainer called Champ, who was a little bit sadistic, and he used to like um, punching them in the belly when they were doing sit-ups. Not too hard, you know, but just hard <laughs> enough. Just hard enough. And th- don't forget, these are mainly upper middle class, quite entitled sometimes um, young men. And it would, it would put an air of seriousness around the gym. And they'd be doing circuits, so they wouldn't all be with Champ at the same time. One of them would be off doing pull-ups, but he'd be doing pull-ups and looking behind to see how hard Champ was. <laughs> and is the other guy taking it well and what's it going to be like for me when I'm there and this air of reality starts to descend upon young men who frankly today um, often aren't living in none of us are um, and particularly young people so that is the aim of it that has that is the function that it, it has always played and with the environment that you were in which was you know at the rougher end of the spectrum even for the UK in the 1970s and 80s that is a good intervention. That's a good thing to have around. Um, goes without saying, really, um, that you know, as you became addicted, the boxing receded. The mm. sport, as it does with all of us, anything of value starts to slide. Your boxing started to slide, and heroin addiction came in really quick off the back of gateway drugs. People laugh about get the concept of gateway drugs, don't they? Uh, the idea that marijuana might be a gateway drug. You said it straight up. You said it was a gateway drug for you. It was for me too. I loved it at first. And then I got bored of it <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> I wanted something else. Um, so perhaps it, the idea of marijuana being a gateway drug is ludicrous for 70% of the population, but it's not ludicrous for us because that's exactly how it worked, right? Yeah. So you were, on, uh, you were using heroin regularly by what, 17? 17 years old, yeah. Right, yeah. Now, um, another interesting um, story. Before we finish the adverse childhood experiences, I just want to set the record straight because um, channel this will be filmed, right, and it will go up on YouTube. And Channel 4 did a massive stitch-up job on Billy. They like stitch, stitching up toxic males. That's their, their thing at the moment. They got um, was it that? Jordan Peterson quite nicely about a year ago. They interviewed Billy and he got a really hostile uh, interview. And the camera kept um, panning in menacingly uh, on his ear, which you may or may not have noticed is half missing. <laughs> okay, and the intimation of this was something like we're glorifying violence, boxing, the crime, this sort of thing. Look at Billy, he's a thug, blah, blah, blah. Uh, how old were you when you lost your ear, Billy? 15, 16. Right. Just going into that age. And uh, what happened? There was a, there was a lad, he was, quite, he was a bully, and he was taking things off of the like, young lads. And, you know, I, just st- I was only small, but I wanted to stand up to him, and I did. And a fight broke out, and I lost my ear. He bit it, and... 
So it's, it's an example of an adverse childhood. Um, that's what it was, you know, and they didn't ask him any questions about that. You know, they didn't. They just made assumptions that this is a result of a bar fight or something like this. And you've actually never been convicted of a violence offence. Mm -hmm. All of your crimes were acquisitive crimes, mm -hmm. right, as is n the norm with addicts. Okay, so I just wanted to set that straight. Thank yep. you. <laughs> <laughs> we stitched Channel 4 up now. Um, right, we'll get to s s Sly Stallone in a minute. Um, I just want to take everyone to how you got to be in Thailand. So you did uh, multiple prison sentences, which is, you know, recidivist um, offending is the norm for heroin users um, in this country anyway. And... <coughs> You got to about 31, and what you uh, we talk about it and laugh about it. Um, you're on your last stint, and we refer to it as the cherry picker incident. Yeah. You were in Walton Prison? Yeah, it's HMP Liverpool. And <laughs> some of the lads decided to have a prison rebellion. Yep. This is relevant. I'm not taking you through this, no, just, no, to, just to torture you. <laughs> um, so you decided to join the rebellion. There's only about five, six guys who climbed up on the roof. Mm. So you got up there, and then what happened? So the first guy that got up, um, it was quite a struggle, really. Uh, it, it, he managed to get up there, it was 70 foot high, and uh, all the winds started to bang, and everyone started to scream, and there was yells of approval, and, and he was standing there like Rocky Balboa with his hands in the air, and everyone was clapping and cheering. And I thought it was a good idea, and I thought, that's what I want. And um, I think it was the oldest at the time out of the group of lads that went up, and I was halfway up the rope, and I remember, I was saying it last night, there was this prison officer called Mr. Muscle, and that was his real name, <laughs> by the way, and um, they were all standing there watching us, they wouldn't dare intervene because there was a, a massive crowd, and um, he, he shouted, you'll never get up there, you fat ass. That's exactly what he said, and I fell off the roof, well, halfway down this rope, um, and it sort of turned into like a North Sea rescue, the way they were, they had to pull me up, the other lads, because of the shame and all that, I wasn't going to allow it. But the minute I got up there and everyone said, and the, the shame experience is the first guy, and I felt really, really important, it suddenly stopped. And it was about the next guy. And I thought, I wanted to jump off. Right. I mean, That's the relevance. That's why I wanted to just yeah. visit that one, because there's a metaphor in here somewhere. You. Um, you wanted to be part of a rebellion, and you wanted to be part of the group, and you got to the top, and there was nothing really that you felt to, to be proud of. No. And you suddenly realized that you were somewhere that you didn't want to be. <laughs> Immediately. Right, right. And in fact, it was the hottest day of the year, and you all got pulled down with heat stroke. Yeah, the <laughs> I actually, I and it's like yeah. the shame of that, yeah. right? It was, a sh it, it was an important moment, I think, because the shame that you felt then triggered you into some kind of growth spurt, right? Yeah. And that was the last stint of prison that you did, and you went in the UK yeah. there at that time, and you went straight into treatment. Yeah. Now in the book, a lot of us from the UK treatment field will, will recognize the treatment center that he went to. Um, Southwest England, just outside Bristol, in the hills, lovely old mansion house, populated mostly by Liverpudlins, Mancunians, Brummies, and EastEnders. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you all know where that was. It's closed now. Um, now, the first of a series of guardian angels showed up. Yeah. It might not seem like it at the time. He might not have even realized he was, do he was opening a gateway for you. But it, to cut a long story short, you had a disastrous few first weeks because you, you didn't do the intimacy thing. No. No, no, no definitely not. And they were all huggers, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of huggers in recovery. Uh, and it can take you aback if you don't know that. Right? <laughs> and, yeah, you were kind of set upon by huggers when you first got there, who, who had good intentions, but you weren't having any of it. And you were exactly the product of what we've just described of your background. And you were your dad, basically. You weren't a touchy-feely guy. Nope. Cut a long story short. You didn't follow the program. You found, wound up at the bottom of the stairs one morning after a night of using, because using was quite often rife in that centre. Um, and the head counsellor gave you a second chance. Yeah. Yeah. And you grabbed it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember he wore a pair of cowboy boots and he was quite different and he had a bald hair and a little leather jacket on. And, you know, I had that street mentality, you know, a track suit and, you know, and, um, 
I went in there and definitely didn't want to be hugging anyone. Um, but people started to say to me, you know, you're okay and, and you're doing well and, yeah. you know, we like you. And, you know, I didn't know what the motive was mm. or what their agenda was. Because all I'd ever heard was, was, uh, was, was like names that were unsavory and, you know, labels that had been given. So when you actually told me it was okay, it was like, it took me by surprise and I, I felt really confused. And even this councillor was saying, you know, there's something about you. Uh, it's just about change. Yeah. And I remember breaking down because there was that thin line between, I knew that I was going to go back out and I'd probably end up dead or lost it in addiction for many, many more miserable years. Or take this chance and try and do something about it. Yeah, I mean, the huggers basically did their job. They got to you. And uh, yeah, the, the group worked. The group process worked. And um, that's the power of the group. And see, so basically, you got your first period of clean and sober time as an adult. You're what, 31, 32, something like that. And a few months in, you went to Thailand. You actually went to Thailand twice. The first trip, you went out soaked up the culture, got a bit into the boxing, mm -hmm. came back. Then the second trip you went out, you're still clean and sober, and you started um, working. You did a bit of a stint as an English teacher. didn't go so well because you got a heavy Scouse accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your words, not mine. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Um, so you took the show fighting, which is, it, you know, let me try and put this into context for you. Um, if you go to Thailand, um, towns like Chiang Mai, maybe, maybe Pattaya, Phuket will have a big area, um, lots of bars and so on, and then there'll be a ring where there are, are, are show fighters, you know, a bit like we used to have in circuses. And I've never seen a foreigner <laughs> working in there because it's a tough gig. You occasionally get, mostly it will be for show, but occasionally you'll get some farang, a foreigner, a westerner, who's usually quite big, will get up and try and challenge them. And of course, they always wind up getting their head kicked in by the Thais, who are about five foot one. But you were eff effectively one of the Thais, and that's how you earned your money. You ate with the Thais, you, s you slept in the same compound, you learned the language. Um, a raw experience, but a real experience. You were in NA regular, you know, you in which has grown hugely in Chiang Mai now. But back then, that was those were the early days of Narcotics Anonymous in Chiang Mai. So you were following a program. Yeah. Now, something went wrong, and, and it goes um, back to uh, intimacy and covering up your feelings and so on. So, uh, like many men, you met a, a lovely uh, Thai girl, uh, Goy. Mm. Yeah. And she just triggered you right up, basically. It yeah. was, you told me the first time you'd actually, like, really, really like somebody. And you're in your early 30s. But this is not unusual for addicted people. That um, you know, we find that somebody, perhaps it's because you'd opened up, perhaps it's because you'd been growing and you were actually able to notice that. So you got quite attached to Goy. Mm. And like many, um, the, cult, the thing in Thailand, the culture is it's not unusual for people to have gicks. A gick is like, um, it's an equal opportunities um, gender-wise form of cheating. So it's a fuck buddy, basically. And the women will have gigs as frequently as men will. In f it's, it, almost every pop song will be about a man, uh, often a man is heartbroken because his girlfriend's got a gig. A gig, well, that begins with a G, by the way. You didn't mishear me. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that happened. And mm. you didn't deal with it well, man. No. Nah. No. Nah. Nah, nah. You stormed off up to the border because you had a visa run. Yeah. You bought some high-grade heroin. Yeah. And like a lot of us have done, again, many times, this, this really rang true for me. You kept it in your hand. You didn't use. You brought it back for a day or two, and you got drunk instead. Mm. And then you got into the yabba. Do you want to explain to the guys what yabba is? Yabba is it's translated into English as crazy drug, so there you go. It's like yabba. It's like methamphetamine in a tablet form so you could like similar to crystal meth um, and it's a tablet um, and you smoke it on the foil and you inhale a smoke and y it's like it's like like a souped up crack, co crack cocaine which is a long lasting effect for me well it was it was quite different um, and it was highly addictive and it was quite cheap and massively produced yeah. so you know you've 
been caught vulnerable, mm. your feelings have come up, you haven't been able to deal with them, you've relapsed. You're in a foreign country where the consequences are very, very bad. You had a good run of dealing and taking Yabar before you got caught, but eventually you got caught. I'm going fast now because you guys can check this out in the film. It's all in the film and the book. And yeah, you got arrested. You managed to get rid of the drugs, but you were actually busted for a little bit of stolen equipment and etc. And you went straight into Chiang Mai Central Prison, yeah. right? So this is what, 2005? 2007. 2007. So I think at this point I'll do the second reading because this is the prologue and this is another great passage from the book that just describes what, it, what it's like in a Thai prison, I think, better than either of us could actually say. Um, you've captured it in writing about as well as it can be captured, I think. So here I want you guys... to focus on the difference between uh, trauma and adversity. We missed a bit about Sylvester Stallone, by the way. He wound up doing a film with, Stis with, with uh, Sylvester Stallone. And I think that was part of the success that took you up high. And then with Gore, the relationship with Goy not working took you right back down. Mm. So now he's really down and he's in prison and he's in Thailand and this is what it's like. And this is what trauma is. A young Thai, no older than 25, ran past me, his face showing pure terror. He slowed and turned to look at his assailant, who then passed me, swinging his metal chair, striking the victim's head. He lost balance, slipped, and hit the concrete with a loud thud. Another man appeared with a nine-inch knife and stood over the young man's body. Anybody who needs a safe space, now's the time to go. A crowd gathered, even trustees stood and watched as the older man repeatedly plunged the knife into the young Thai's flesh. It wasn't done in frenzy, it was slow, cold and calculated. Still no one helped or attempted to intervene. They all just stared, whilst a few shouted, Ten Cow and Ka Man. I knew enough Thai to understand that the crowd was shouting, Stab him and kill it. The knife man kept thrusting the blade into the young man's body, each time sinking it in up to the handle. The knife went into his neck, lower back, chest, legs and stomach so many times I lost count. I stood only a few feet away watching in fascination and feeling guilty. Finally the victim lay still and quiet in a pool of his own blood. It was horrible. I felt bad for not helping, but what could I do? This was a Thai problem and I was a foreigner, one of many in Klong Prem prison. More than a week passed before I could sleep without replaying the murder of the young man over and over again in my head in slow motion. So that is trauma. That is not adversity, that is trauma. Um, you would be in that situation, watching it, and you would be vicariously traumatized. The reason why you would be vicariously traumatized is number one, you think that could happen to me. But number two, it's on a deeper existential level. It could happen to me is on two levels. Level number one, I'm trapped inside four walls with about X amount of men and this could literally happen to me. Number two, much deeper existential level, this is what human beings are capable of and therefore this can happen to me. Right, yeah. So, it's a pretty chilling passage, and that's what you were living with. Mm. Yeah, that is what you were living with. In the words of Bessel van der Kolk, when you're traumatized, it's do or die. When you've been abused, hurt, or abandoned, you either go on with your life or you lie down and let life roll over you. And that now is about to unfold for you. Mm. And what struck me in the book is that all of the foreigners, actually, the other foreigners, um, got rolled over actually, if we're honest about it. Mm. And you very, very nearly did. And what jumps out at you in, in the book is just the amount of death that was around. It wasn't just violence, it was illness and disease and God knows what else. And I think this is, so that's actually you um, on arrest and Joe Cole obviously on the right. How were people coping in prison with trauma? Not just foreigners, also ties. I mean, the answer's fairly obvious. 
What was, how, how did people get by? Taking copious amounts of drugs or having loads of sexual interaction with, with, um, with, with ladyboys. Um, was just killing each other. There was, uh, there was no coping. It was just constant. It was like the city of God one. See, the, the title of the book is called A Prayer Before Dawn for a reason. It's not religious in any sense. You know, because I was an atheist and I was in a shell with, with like 40 inmates and every, there was 20,000 in this whole complex. And every morning, they'd wake me up about five o'clock uh, praying. You could hear it rev break through the whole prison system. Um, it was like a hypnotic beat and it was, the sh you know, it was the, the Muslims would pray first and then the Buddhists would pray. And then they'd go out, it'd just be unleashed into this, this, this violent world of, uh, you know, people selling things and buying things and, uh, and taking things and dealing drugs and that's how most people got through it at that time. I mean, you'd had, um, in the midst of your using, you'd gone to Laos, the next door country, to get the visa sorted out and had a terrible motorcycle accident. Yeah. And so you had your, you know, your, your innards were kind of not... Yeah, that was my <laughs> fault, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, but see. you've got these terrible injuries and that, what struck me is that was the case with a lot of inmates. They had terminal illnesses or had that in and out of the very basic hospital facilities regularly, people dying of their injuries and of illnesses because the medical cover wasn't enough. Just, I think you use the words, ever presently surrounded by death. Yeah. 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 There was a lot of HIV mm. and AIDS. There mm. was an epidemic in there. There's mm. people, you know, people were getting uh, taken out in body bags mm. on, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Mental health was massive. People were stabbing themselves. Uh, with ice picks, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about weapons, not homemade, mm -hmm. like razor blades and a toothbrush, we're talking about machetes and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and hatchets, I don't know where they got them from, but they used them to cut up the ice, mm -hmm. um, and I think they were given to trusted inmates that weren't really trusted anyway, mm -hmm. uh, that you were used mm -hmm. to, to, to attack mm -hmm. other inmates. And so before we get on to how you got out of this, Probably the biggest threat to you that was coming is in order to survive this in any way mentally, everybody takes copious amounts of drugs, which then involves debt, which then involves potentially being murdered because of the debt. <laughs> yeah. Right. And at that point, Guardian Angel number two makes his appearance. You'd been involved in some kind of tear up for the umpteenth time, yeah. and you were taken off to the governor, and he had a deputy called. Prasit? Prasit. Prasit. Yeah, yeah. So Prasit suggested that you might be not long for this world. Yeah. A good man. I mean, where do these people come from? They just suddenly appear um, in the midst of lots and lots of not very good people. <laughs> and he suggested moving you over to a wing where there was a boxing team and yeah. you were effectively moved over. But it wasn't quite that simple because you turned up to the cage, as it were, that separates the gym and the guys who are training who are almost an elite group and you knock on the gate to get in and they are not interested in letting you in oh. but nothing that a few hundred cigarettes can't sort out mm. so he bribed um, Nan the coach who was guardian angel number three he turned out to be a mentor effectively for you he relented opened up let you in let, let the foreigner in and then you began and this is the crux of our talk, really. Growth doesn't, um, post-traumatic growth doesn't come as a result of trauma automatically, obviously. It's how you deal with the reality in the aftermath of it, what you choose to do. And in environments like inner cities, as Billy will tell you when we talk about his anti-knife crime initiatives and so on at the end of the talk, you, these projects have their critics and people say is it really an adaptive thing to do is it too brutal we'll look at the reality of the situation knife crimes pretty brutal this prison environment was pretty brutal there's one way out of this situation for Billy and also for a lot of other people and I would say for more people than we might like to think which is to put ourselves in an environment that is 
if necessary, to voluntarily put ourselves in an environment that's bound by some kind of honor, and I use that word in the loosest way, some kind of mild fear and adversity, fear of a healthy type, rules, physical discipline, and some kind of uh, camaraderie. And in this case, it was a brotherhood, because obviously it's a male prison, and we're talking about Muay Thai boxing. So this, this shot is from the film, and I think it fairly accurately captures a, thai, a, a Muay Thai gym, in a sense, any Muay Thai gym, and probably particularly one in a prison. You can't see the photo too well, but what it is is Nat, the guy that's playing Nan, the head coach, is intervening in between an altercation between two boxers that happens to be Joe Cole, who's playing Billy, and another guy. And look how all the guys are standing. It's not a free-for-all. They're standing there with their hands, uh, with straight backs, with their hands behind their backs. None of these guys are getting out of prison ever. They're in hell, effectively. And they are living a life of rigorous discipline. And this is what not only saved you physically, but saved you spiritually, really, because you started to break bread with these guys and you ate with them. They treated you like a human being and you earned your spurs by way of representing the prison in inter-prison fights. And this is undoubtedly what was your salvation. Yeah. So talk to us of what it did for you psychologically and spiritually to be allowed into this brotherhood. It was a way like, for me to escape the austerity and, 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 and the barbaric surroundings that I was placed in. And um, that preserved the officer preserved the, because I was always fighting and getting involved in, in, in little scrapes and that, which weren't really little scrapes, they were quite, quite a lot. You know, he wanted to learn English and he said, you like the Oscar de la Hoya, this prison, and he said, I'd like you to join this, this, this boxing team, you know, and um, they were being a little bit unreasonable, they wouldn't let me in because I had a name for myself, I was quite volatile. And I was only like, it was I like a re everything was like a reaction ship. There was never any relationships. I'd react to what people would say, and you know, I'd come up with venom. But once I kind of got myself inside, they left me to me to, to my own devices. They observed me. They watched me on the bags. They watched me in the ring. They knew we had some skills. They knew I was willing. They wa that I wanted to change it because I turn up every day. I'd be there first thing in the morning and at least last thing at night. So there was that kind of willingness and then, um, you know, gradually they started to sit down and, and no one, the language barrier was quite difficult, so I couldn't communicate with any of them. You know, it was, it was pidgin English. Yeah, the only kind of like people who could barely speak Thai was the lady boys and, you know, they, were, they all fancied me, so. We have to avoid that one. Okay, yeah, we'll <laughs> leave that one for a later we'll discussion. We'll move on from that, but yeah, yeah um, this was more, it was more like when they were sitting down and, and we started to kind of communicate. We didn't even have to speak the same language. You know, it was just, we just knew, just, just a bit of touch, a bit of intimacy, a bit of unity, you know, a bit of support. Uh, and, and the welcome. And the teaching me as well. They were showing me moves that were quite... It's a dichotomy, isn't it? Yeah. This is what people, this is, this is the, the key element of what we're talking about. It's a dichotomy because on the face of it, um, it's painful to do things like boxing, um, especially when you fight. Um, Muay Thai is especially painful, quadruple painful, because you've got <laughs> three other l l limbs that are allowed rather than just your fists. You're using your, your knees, your shins, your elbows. And that would seem to be brutal, and in our current um, bubble that we live in, in this world, um, we could just put that down to unnecessary brutality and stupidity and why would you do it and so on and so forth. On the other hand, um, there's a seriousness about it precisely for that reason. There's a focus that comes precisely for that reason. I'm not saying you can't get that focus from rock climbing or triathlon or something else. You can and arguably should. But there's also a, com a camaraderie and a respect that, c that comes and then a willingness to teach each other. And as we said in the research about young male rats, a bonding agent that starts to run through the group. And the more adverse the environment, the more necessary that kind of set of type of rules becomes. 
And my contention would be that we've got into a very big bubble in uh, modern society. And there are times and places when we need to look at perhaps self-inflicted adversity <laughs> for its potential for hormetic growth. We need to stress ourselves in the right way. Uh, we don't need to be totally unstressed. So this is something that you've you know, found by hook or by crook. You kind of found this out the hard way. Obviously, in our treatment programs that I've run, we've done it deliberately. We have deliberately staged these adversities, M obviously hugely reduced, um, but it's the same principle. The principle of growth through adversity, not growth necessarily through talking about your feelings all the time. Talk therapy has its place. We now increasingly understand the importance of body-based therapies and non-verbal therapies, and my contention is, uh, particularly for young men, but not exclusively, there are plenty of young women who could also avail themselves of this. It is about the way that we move. We can make changes to our thinking through our behaviors first. We, we know full well now that our emotions are always playing catch up with our behaviors. It's our behaviors that come first, our emotions come second. It's a bit like the old 12-step classic, get your ass to a meeting and your, and your brain and mind will follow. Well, the same thing holds true for any kind of progress. We do it first and then the emotions catch up later. So I just want to sort of start winding down now and I think we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end. But first of all, let's just look at some more things that Bessel van der Kolk has to say. Um, I'm not sure if Bessel van der Kolk would approve of my methods. Um, <laughs> But he does uh, prescribe yoga and, th and movement um, for the cessation of um, serious PTSD symptoms. He talks about how the polyvagal nerve is very involved in trauma. So in other words, um, for those of you who haven't read The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk, he explains how trauma happens. And the, the polyvagal nerve runs through the body and obviously connects to neural networks. And, and so... Um, trauma and trauma symptoms are not just obviously a neural event, a, a, a brain thing. It's a physiological experience. And you can take this down to sort of mild uh, small t traumas, if you want to call them that, or what I'd call adversities. Like um, being gutted really is like being gutted because you're stuck, the polyvagal nerve is there working its way around the guts and, the in and other body areas. Uh, having a broken heart really does feel like you've got a broken heart. So, that, so we know now what the hormonal, what, what the circuitry is that's causing this, and it's bodily, it's not just cognitive and um, head-based. So movement works, things like yoga work, things like dance works. Um, for young men who've got a lot of um, aggression, and again, I don't, as you, I'm sure you've already um, worked out. I don't have a lot of time for concepts like to toxic masculinity. I think we've got toxic masculinity arises because we're not placing and directing that, um, that type of masculinity anymore. We're just not doing it. So it's not about how are young men socialized. It's nothing to do with that. We've evolved that way over millions of years because there's a hell of a lot of predators out there. And we tend to battle each other. That's what human males do. Human male primates have spent millennia battling each other for reproductive access to females. This is the biology of it, and we are aggressive primates. It's not going to go away by loads of woke talk. It's not just going to disappear because we got woke. It's there, it's in us. Socialization is important too. It plays its role, but it's interacting. So I say it's not going anywhere in a certain amount of males and never will. No matter how much we change our culture and our ideas and how we school boys, it will not disappear. It will always be there. And there will be women who are like this too. And for that significant minority, we need to have a rethink. We need to have a paradigm shift in how we do therapy, particularly with men. We're, we're using a fragilista model, as Nassim Taleb would call it. Yeah. It's all about the talking, and it's not with men, it's not always about the talking. In fact, it frequently isn't, and with many, many women too. Um, so, Bessel van der Kolk says 
you know, the more trauma someone has in the background, potentially the more successful and a creative person they become. And you can see this. This is almost a cliche in hyper-successful people. They are often not normal. You know, they're, they're seriously unnormal. They've had an awful lot of experiences, some of them pretty bad. And th somehow, some way, they've turned that round. We could do with knowing that. That would be really good to know. And it's about the struggle. We have to find new possibilities, which is something arguably that Billy did in a very basic way with the only thing that was available. Um, so he channeled what he had into what he knew. Now, these are five specific areas of post-traumatic growth that I'm going to ask you, Billy, how, you know, how it's gone for you. They are um, an increase in personal strength, obviously not physical strength. Um, your inner resources, if you like, are increased, your psychological strength. An improvement in your relationship with others, new perspectives on life, a new appreciation of life and spirituality, or growth in the sort of spiritual arena, whatever that means for you. So in the book, there's a really great passage towards the end. Um, two lovely policemen come over um, from the UK to escort you back after you get a pardon from the King of Thailand, which yeah. is a sort of every four years there's an amnesty, and you had your sentence reduced, and some prison officers or policemen? Prison officers. Prison officers came over and took you back. The first thing that struck you when you were on the plane was how much everyone was whinging about their <laughs> food, seat, etc. You know, I'm guilty as charged. I'm that man. I'm the one moaning about the middle seat and the crap food. Um, but of course, it really jumped out at you. Mm. Now, I'd suggest to you that that's because you've had this. So you're experiencing a force of actually quite a unique human experience, a new appreciation of life, <laughs> which you see in juxtaposition to other people's non-appreciation of their life. And it really jumped out at you, right? So we know that you were going through that. You actually write about it in the book. But have you found, with say, for example, your relationship with others improving? Uh, you've been doing a lot. I see you on... Instagram stuff doing a lot with like your autistic brother. Mm. Now I bet that was something that wasn't really there before. No, um, you know drugs were more important, and, and you know he was. I took my younger brother who's got autism uh, for granted because he lived with my mum, and you know I felt that she'd take care of him. You know, and I've spent a lot of time with him recently, and um, you know I, I think we're all guilty of this. You know, Facebook, social media, scrolling on our phones, and. You know, my little brother's sitting there and he's trying to ask me a question and tell me about his day and I'm saying, you know, give us a minute and, you know, that minute turns into, you know, an hour and then an hour turns into a few days and then, you know, years just go by. Because um, I don't really want to notice, you know, I don't really want to, you know, that self sense part of me wants to get on with my own life and um, it just hit me, it just hits home and I thought, you know what, it's, 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 it's a bad enemy. The, the people who are loyal and, and love us the most are the ones that are sitting next to us. You know, not someone who's out there and, and, you know, putting a picture on Facebook about the dinner and, you know, you're going to comment on it. It's like, you, I've show, I started to develop this relationship with my brother, which is just, just become really loving and beautiful and, and, and it, it's blossomed and it's to a point where we spend a lot, lot of time together. And now he's joined this all-inclusive boxing club, for, you know, for young people with autism. Um, and I take him along. Yeah, and he's getting involved and, you know, then I'm interacting with, with the other kids in there who've got autism. I teach other young kids boxing as a hobby. You know, it's a hobby for me because they enjoy it. And, um, you know, they they feel inspired and, 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 you know, like a role model sense. Um, I'm starting to show them that, you know, and their mum say to me, have a word to them when you're when you're on the way home, Bill, about, like, you know, respect and discipline, you know, because they're behaving a little bit erratic at home. And, you know, they're starting to do this and that, and, and I do so. I don't just take them to the gym uh, and train them. I speak to them. You know, we do what we do, and I say, you know, it doesn't mean you know to be a man that you've got to be be violent and aggressive and, and start bullying and showing your skills off around the house. It's it, it's about like this is a sport. It's an art. It's it's about thinking about uh, what you want to do with your life and have respect for you, for, for, for your family and people in the community. So that's kind of right. I don't know, it's, that, that relationship with others is, is, is being great. And the perspective, I mean, these perspectives on life, um, you know, we're only here for a few short decades. I've realised that, you know what I mean? But then we're gone, we're gone, that's it, end off. 
You know, we can either talk about our feelings all day long, you know what I mean, until we start growing flowers, or we can start moving forward and start developing and start being strong in ourselves. And I've never took an antidepressant. I don't believe in them. That's just my opinion. Um, I think, you know, natural body endorphins, um, you know, create a lot of, like, like, passion for life, you know. Some of us are overweight. I've started to intermittently fast, so that's why I was interested in hemesis because, um, you know, your body starves itself of food and, you, and, you know, you start having a low calorie intake, so you start disciplining your own body to, to change the composition of it, which is, I found really interesting. Um, and I do appreciate life because I've been through many, many sentences and I've been not only in the UK and, and foreign countries, you know, on chemotherapy for a long time and, you know, actually come through that and almost two years clear of cancer. Uh, and back in recovery because of, you know, a reintroduction to, to, to chemo brought a relapse. Yeah, so th those kind of also take us to the last one. Spirituality. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit in there with mentoring others, right? It mm. must, I don't know if you find that to be a spiritual experience or something along those lines. And then there's um, fellowship with others. We don't always want to go uh, to be with others, you know, but paths of growth, sometimes we don't want to do it. But you've done it yeah. and you continue to do it. I don't mind organ people, though. <laughs> That's growth. Yeah. That's PTG. That's post-traumatic growth. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, especially, um, you know, it's like spirituality. You know, it's um, for me. It's 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 about being in being in a position to save others. Uh, I tell you what, the rewards I get, right? It's just massive. It's massive. I never really experienced this. It's like when I do something for someone else without a motive or an agenda, and it's like it's coming from the heart, and it's me integrity is intact. It's like I'm doing this because I want to do it. I'm not doing it for the likes on social media or, or for the retweets or for me only. I'm not interested. I'm not asked about a job. I'm not interested in money and nothing, right? Um, if I can put a smile on your face and I can do something for you which is going to benefit your life, then, you know, that's, that's all right with me because, you know, that's what I wanted growing up. Is your um, spiritual beliefs or your spiritual model have an element of physical uh, that you have to be physically active in yeah it. constantly yeah you know it's, um, for me it's, it's like you know a, a set of regime and discipline that, and I like to train and um, that is part of my life and part of my recovery and part of my journey and it's uh, it doesn't it's, it's not only developed me me, uh, me self esteem and, and, and the respect for myself and I feel good about myself if I'm sitting at home eating a pack of crisp, you know, or, or ordering pizza, and then complaining about putting weight on and not even going for a walk, you know, then it, it, it starts feeling low about myself, and then other things start. I'm, and I'm going to say it out with the fuck it's kicking, then ah, fuck it, can't be asked. You know what I mean? So I get myself, mo it's about life, for, for, for not only for me, but I believe for everyone else. Motivation, drive, just getting there, just getting changed. That's a beginning. You know, it's not about um, thinking about doing something. It's, doing it's incremental it. steps as well, isn't it? And, yeah. and, and, and they have knock-on effects. And, you know, we laugh, but it, it's, this is the thing about recovery, is I don't think recovery is, is looked at in a, a holistic enough way. And I think that um, diet and exercise, we almost, um, in a lot of treatment centers, just to talk of treatment centers, we often remove that out of fear of body image issues and eating disorders, etc., which is, you know, obviously relevant. But what we do, if we're not careful, is we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because for every client that may have body image um, issues, which is potentially all of them, um, but it won't necessarily be a first order priority for many, out of fear, we often remove um, physical dis discipline, physical culture, training from the program, which I believe is just a massive mistake. I'd rather make the opposite mistake. I'd rather, you know, risk that and then be able to see somebody's acting out with their body image or their eating and just actually be able to see it going on. Um, so we've always promoted it. And also to speak of other sports, because we've been very fight sport orientated, obviously, because we've got Billy as a guest. 
but there is a sort of self-imposed suffering, which I suppose could have some addictive qualities to it um, by way of things like triathlons. So we've got, you know, people in this room who've done Ironman triathlons, etc., as part of their recovery. And again, you run a potential risk of exercise addiction, so-called. Um, it's a difficult addiction to get because it hurts so bloody much on the way <laughs> up. So good luck with that, you know. Um, Mostly its, it's um, effects are beneficial uh, by way of what Billy spoke about, increased endorphins and um, endocannabinoids and all sorts of good stuff <laughs> going on in your head endogenously. And it makes a hell of a difference to then be able to eat a good meal. You, have you ever noticed how after you work out you eat a good meal? Because you don't work out, you eat a rubbish meal and they're related and the steps are incremental. And lots and lots of bad decisions eventually equate to a not very good situation and vice versa. So I think we do have to look at recovery more holistically and look at the role that um, nutrition and exercise play. Okay, so in the end, this is where um, Billy ended up, the uh, Cannes Film Festival, uh, next to these you know, accomplished people, Joe Cole the um, beautiful Thai actress there and the not so beautiful Thai actor with the uh, shades on. Uh, he's a funny guy and he's a big celeb in Thailand, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this is post-traumatic growth. It's occupational growth, um, physical health growth, psychological and emotional progress as um, Billy's able to sort of, you know, hold it together at a high level. And you know, you've got all your health issues going on in the background, and yet you're holding it together. Um, so this is really, you know, just the most potent example that I could see in, in recent literature of something that describes the personal growth process post-trauma, real trauma, and post-childhood adversity. We're going to have a fairly long Q&A session, but before we do, um, I just want to flag up um, Billy's projects that he's involved with. Billy's involved with Danny's Place, which, as we've mentioned, is an anti-knife crime uh, initiative in Liverpool that's been started by uh, Mandy Jameson, who I believe tragically lost her son a few years ago to last knife year. Crime. Last yeah, year. Yeah, last year. Okay. And so you can find Danny's Place on Twitter and Facebook. Um, Billy's very involved with that, as well as um, general mentoring in the local community. Um, I've got myself involved in um, the d with the DARE network over the last year or so. Um, DARE are a foundation that run f five treatment centers in five refugee camps on the Myanmar Thai border. Obviously, I live in Chiang Mai in northern Thailand, which is where my um, businesses have been located. but. There are 90,000 people in those refugee camps. They're mostly Karen ethnic group, so not to be confused with the Rohingya that are on the other border with Bangladesh. So the um, Karen ethnic groups and other ethnic minority hill tribes have been getting um, chased up against the border by the Burmese military for about 20, 30 years now. Um, a hotbed of Yabar production, lots of methamphetamine labs getting moved around all over the place, huge producer of methamphetamine, so a lot of addicted people stuck in refugee camps. And so we raised a little bit of money for them last year. There they are in group in the morning. They have auricular acupuncture, they do yoga, they use herbal um, remedies for their detoxes. <laughs> They're, but, you know, they are really, really to my mind, put a lot of Western treatment centers to shame, quite frankly, the um, intensity of what they do on the budget that they have. So keep your, eye op uh, keep your eyes open for either their campaigns directly, which is Burmese Refugee Prevent Addiction and Violence, or Burmese Refugees Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Also look for me, Alistair Mordi, on Global Giving, because I'm going to try and raise money by way of getting my butt back into triathlons this year. We might put some white collar boxing events on to raise money uh, for that. And then last not, but not least, um, do help me and Billy um, get in our message out there by way of um, the spawn of Satan known as Twitter 
and Instagram and Facebook. Um, so Billy's is um, Billy Moore APD Twitter, Billy slash Moore slash APD for Instagram and author Billy Moore on Facebook. I'm Alistair Mordy across the board apart from Instagram where I'm Ali Mordy. Um, yeah, that would really, really help greatly if you guys could check out some of our material. And please do interact with us. We're very interactive on there. We don't, you know, we generally tend to answer people and get into debates and probably a hell of a lot more than we should, uh, frankly. Um, and so, yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. We will take questions and answers. But I just, uh, I really want to just before we finish say um, thanks to Billy. We took, we had maybe t 10 Skype sessions and we've been hanging out the last couple of days intensively. Um, it was my um, firm intention that we didn't take Billy anywhere that he didn't want to go. He's been immensely um, grounded through the whole thing, um, which frankly is another sign of you know the things that he's learned in life. And I think the reason he does this, if I might say this, um, is because he thinks that his message is important. And for all the people out there who have become addicted by way of serious trauma, he is surely something of um, an inspiration for them in the way that he's embodied post-traumatic growth. So I just want to really thank him. Uh, maybe we can give him a round of applause for being so awesome. Yeah. Great. So. Um, if you want to go and get caffeinated, do so. If you want to stay and talk to us, do so. And we'll take any questions and, all, um, and answer them as best we can. Um, and maybe I'll send the mic round if anybody's got a question. David. Ali, great. Um, David Carter. Um, I own a business in, in uh, Spain called the Marbella Sober Home. We're probably one of the very few secondary care facilities in Europe, I think. I've been looking around, I can't find any. But Billy, uh, I, I watched the film and I actually boxed myself. I'm training to do a white collar um, later on this year. And um, if you ever want to come to the south coast of Spain, we'll pay for you to come over and you can come and train at uh, Impact Gym where we send our guys. Um, they kickbox in the boxing and a lot of people are getting, a, a lot of girls actually go and, and they're getting a lot of benefit from it. Personally, I find that it clears my mind and it really helps me centre myself and I like doing it in the morning. I don't know if, if you've got a view on that. Do you train in the morning or the afternoon? I tend to train in the morning, but I can sometimes train. I can vary my days, the times through the day, like, but morning's the best. So I, if I don't train, my mental health decreases during the day. Yeah. End of story. So a uh, question for you, Ali. Um, there is a lot of stigma around physical exercise in recovery. Okay, so we're in, in Spain, we've got everything there you could possibly imagine. So we chuck people out of aeroplanes. People say, why are you doing that? And I said, well, because it's good fucking fun. <laughs> That's the first thing. And then we're training for um, ultra marathons at the moment. So we run through waterfalls, we run over mountains, and it's exhausting. We're out for five, six, seven hours a day, you know, or especially on the weekends. And it's, it's and when, I, when, when we get back, we're exhausted, but we're exhilarated into a meeting. And I just wanted to get your view on that, please. Um, that's a totally awesome question with huge levels that you can go on to. And they're quite serious questions. So um, throwing ourselves out of aeroplanes can be very adrenaline um, pumping. And potentially, some would say, not the sort of thing that you want to do in recovery. And the same by way of excessive exercise. The criticism, and it's really valid criticism, with some teeth behind it and some research behind it, is that the more extreme you go in your sports, the more you are acting out. Let's be honest, right? That's the kind of policy. And if I had a quid for every time I was doing an ultra marathon or something like that, and someone sidled up alongside me, as they do, because you're virtually walking sometimes, and they, they come up alongside you, and then they start talking, and they start saying, oh, yeah, I used to drink a lot. Um, but then I, I started doing ultramarathons, and they're as dry drunk as hell. And they've only gotten sobriety through torturing themselves through ultramarathons. Marathon running is also the last great hideout of the male anorexic. So there's a vast amount of male anorexia in endurance sports. Put that to one side, and then think, well, we know all that. 
And we're going to do some of those things anyway, but we're going to do it knowing all of those clinical issues. Now we're in a different territory because we're not doing it ignorantly. We're not um, doing marathons with no idea uh, that it can be part of an anorexic or bulimic um, profile. We're doing it in full knowledge of that. And we're looking for the clinical signs of those things. And it may even be a boon because we get to draw out somebody who's a damn expert at hiding those things. So what we're suggesting doing, and David's you know, like right onto this, is that, look at it this way, for young people in particular, and I always like to say young men, because I do a lot of work with young men, it's a Jungian thing. It's, there's some need in people um, to go into some kind of underworld or to go into some kind of challenge and adversity. I tell you what, we find it, if we're not given it, we find it. And we'll go and find it anyway. And it's a very perverse side of human nature. And I believe it is very uh, much what addiction is all about, which is why addiction is a disease of modernity. You don't find a lot of suicide in countries that are war-torn. You don't find a lot of anorexia in countries where there isn't a lot of food to eat. You don't find a lot of addiction in countries where there are terrible existential battles uh, and that make your life full of meaning and purpose. There's not an increase in alcohol abuse and drug abuse during wars. People in psychiatric establishments get let out during wars and start driving ambulances. Their symptoms go away. There's something about adversity and stress which is bonding and a massive tonic with regard to meaning and purpose. So when we get to things like you're basically saying taking people on an adventure, it has some power in it. We've just got to do it in a way that we're aware of all the other clinical issues that come from body image and so on. And if we know what we're doing with that, we can use this as a tool and we ought to stop just putting it to one side because we can't be bothered to do it because it's logistically difficult off the excuse of things like ED and body image. So that's my take on it. Billy, I grew up in the north of England, north of you, in oh. Cumbria. I've lived in the United States for most of my life. So I didn't grow up in Liverpool, but I grew up in the same home that you did. My Irish Catholic father was a brutal, brutal man. And it took me until five, six, seven years ago to be able to even say it out loud, because this thought we have of honoring our father kind of got in the way. So as you were talking about your own experiences in your own home, I'm trying to fuse to this wall because I realize that you've just told me again how uncomfortable that was. And then the further you talked about it, I kind of felt myself pulling towards you because you and I could have a conversation and absolutely understand what the hell we were talking about because in essence we grew up in the same house. And that has never happened to me before. And I've done a lot of work here. And the other interesting thing is that in one of my last presentations, I actually added slides with regard to post-traumatic growth because I suddenly realized that that's where I was living. So I want to thank you very, very much for just being here and being you and having just the ability to talk about your experience, and I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, David. <laughs> Any more? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been an absolutely fascinating talk, and it's felt a real privilege to, to be here. Thank you. Um, I specialise in sex and pornography addiction, so work almost predominantly with men. And I'm really curious whether you're aware of any research that's been done on the testosterone links. So certainly a lot of my clients really do encourage them to get into sports. I work with a lot of angry young men or men that have come from very angry backgrounds, and their acting out is pornography. Is, is the sexual stuff. So, and of course, I'm a sex therapist as well. So, obviously, we, we know about the links between sexuality, 
aggression, exercise, testosterone. That's a common denominator in all of this. So just whether there's, you know, of any research on this, thoughts, stuff, that kind of thing. <laughs> Paula, right? Yeah, thanks Paula, that's an awesome, deep question. Um, yeah, that's a bit of an intimidating question. What am, how am I gonna answer that? Um, I'll go first, shall I? Yeah. Um, you talk, the sort of Kahn's model talks about things like eroticized rage. I think, you know, you might be going down that, um, that angle a bit. And I'm very much of, as you've probably picked up, um, of the opinion that I look at uh, the whole illness. We do need to get illness specific or mode specific sometimes with addictions. And for example, mutual aid programs do. You know, it is helpful to go to an S fellowship if you're a sex or love addict, we have sex and love addiction issues, rather than try and work it out in NA. And we know this, and we do, we do that. That's why we have different fellowships. On the other hand, um, it's the same beast, like within, you know, manifesting in different ways. Right, okay. So, what, right, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because there's a huge debate raging at the moment between sex therapists and some clinical psychologists and the sex addiction model that was we won't bore you with, but we'll have a good conversation about later. But the, yeah, the idea that you, you could use up your testosterone levels to some extent by other, by way of other activities? That, yes. Yeah, you know testosterone is a, you know, by builds on itself. So right. You will create more and more of it before you engage in something. Right. Unless you go to the point of exhaustion. Yes, okay. So yeah, it's complex, but Having an outlet. It can be too sex, so yes. Yes. Right. So for those, um, like when the, if it, if it's being filmed, I'm not sure if it is being filmed. I think it is. Um, what Paula said there was, yeah, you could bring it down to a very simplistic way of saying that you could use up all your energy, all of your vital energy, or your creative energy, or your angry energy by way of exercise rather than sex. And yeah, absolutely. And plus that for all the addictions. So you're going to be significantly less triggerable, I would say, less um, even emotionally triggerable or just um, by way of cues, you know, drug cues that you might see if you're exhausted, tired, etc. So I always think, you know, somebody who's athletic should go to bed exhausted. But I'd widen that out for all people. I think it's great to be um, virtuously exhausted, if that makes sense. You've done all the things you know you should have done. Um, you've gotten your life in order today in all the small incremental ways that you could have done. And for me, that, and I'm sure for Billy, that must involve something physical. It must. Um, and so undoubtedly, well, one of the main central tenets is get busy, get better, which is specific to sex addiction, right? I don't hear that too much um, in NA, AA, those kinds of fellowships. You hear it a lot in S fellowships. Get busy, get better. It's about occupying your time. It's about occupying your mind. It's about diverting yourself. Treat yourself as though you were a child. Don't go to, to war with them. Divert them into another activity so they don't even notice. You know, get sneaky with your addiction. And then you're taking, as you know, um, lots of time, empty hands, devil's workshop. Yeah, so definitely, I'm not too au fait with the testosterone, but that's interesting. I bet uh, you know a good dozen of us will go away and Google that like mad afterwards. So. <laughs> Anything to add? I'll have a go. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the therapist or the counsellor or the man with the book. Um, I just know for me uh, in the early days of recovery, um, it was a way of escaping. No, and I looked at like you could put me in a ring, uh, and I was conditioned to to, to punch who's getting through at me, and you know you could put a plaster on on a cut, or you could heal a broken arm with with with. But it was the the affairs of the heart, you know, um, you know uh, the, the rejection from from girls, and then I'd say you know I I you know and I don't say this like just to, it was when I was rejected by a female. She has to be a lesbian, right? <laughs> She's got to be because how that was my attitude. And how could she not like me? Oh my God! And and um, I think it was the 
where you're talking about pornography and that, it was like, it's a, it, it, you know, the fantasy was better than the reality. It was the lack of control. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, it was quite awkward to kind of, the intimacy part of it, you know, because you could have the sexual interaction, but then you've got to hug them and hold them and hold hands and talk to them about what you're going to do. And you don't want to be, you don't want to escape pretty quick. So there's a lot of one-night stands, isn't there, which kind of end up with trans sexually transmitted diseases, which is massive as well in, in, in areas. But for me, um, I believe that, you know, I don't act out now in, in those ways. I haven't done for a long, long time. Um, and I feel better about myself. Um, I don't go and say it's pornography sites. I have done, you know what I mean? Because I was curious and growing up. But um, I think we all have. And <laughs> but the, the laughing is the identification, so that's enough. Uh, that's that's what it is. So, but yeah, um, I think physical kind of sports kind of drain you of kind of the fact that you, you know, the, the you've got another purpose. You know what I mean? You're not sitting at home and and fantasizing and, and and doing things that don't make you feel good. You know, because they never make you feel good. It's like it's quite um, it was quite um. Quite horrible, you know. It it drains the soul, and, and, and I learned that. So, yeah, I think I think f driving myself into or or anybody else is it's, it's physical kind of experiences changes. You know, in those ways, like eating a bag, you know, is kind of a release. Pornography for some people is, I don't know whether it's a release, it's just an escapism, and it really it's kind of like also change the way you feel because you can't, you know handle the present moments which was probably the case i don't feel well equipped on this topic to i'm just giving you my experience um i'm not really um i just know that i don't do it no more and, and, and i do other things but you know and it didn't make me feel good when i did do it you know what i mean that's to be honest like that's a great answer um that's it we're at 3:30. so once again i'd just like to thank billy moore very much Thank you.